So that was a completely different type of a deer. They were both older age class bucks, completely separate personalities. The most memorable hunts I think would surprise you. Everybody would assume that it was the biggest deer. That's where the whole dream big idea came from, was, was taking this idea and making it into something big. And Midwest Whitetail was an idea that became something big, and my farm was an idea that became something big. It's time to watch Midwest Whitetail. Last week on Midwest Whitetail, I promised that I would come back again this week and talk about the bucks that we killed on the farm that I just sold, and then uh, some of my best memories from hunting there, maybe even a few lessons that I learned. So next, Josh has put together a montage of all the bucks that we killed on video. So we started Midwest Whitetail in 2008, and that first year we were filming uh, on that farm. So we've got the hunts on that farm from 2008 through the 2019 season. So let's take a look at those first, then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the hunting and some of the things that I learned. Well, here he is. I can't believe I got him. I know, that's awesome, Jerry. Thanks. You made a great hit on him. Well, I just shot a great buck. I was looking, it was a, <laughs> you caught me totally by surprise. I'm still, my knees are still shaking from the excitement of it, but. It is a great buck. I, I didn't have an appreciation for what stickers meant. I, I saw the footage, but you don't see it up and close and personal like that. But wow, now that is a that's an impressive deer. I don't know if you can appreciate the size of this body, but he just came out of nowhere. Drew was filming a turkey or something over there, and he goes, "There's a big buck coming." And I look up, and he's a whopper. He's a beautiful deer. I never expected this spot to work <laughs> right by a road. Big eight point. Huge G2s. Oh man, he's he's awesome. What a fantastic night. The end of the trail. Good to find this guy. Nice mature deer. Plenty more camera work to do for me yet this weekend. Chris shot a nice nine point buck last night. And now this buck uh, on a one stand. It goes without saying that this is gonna be a, <laughs> a season I'll never forget and likely never duplicate. Right behind his shoulder. I got him. You have to hit him. Knees are still shivering, that's the only part of my body that's shivering, it's my knees, because I'm so excited. I got him. My first buck, my first buck with a bow. <sighs> He's an awesome buck, fully mature. Um, proud to shoot him. It's fun to have a deer that, that you've got that much history with, and then be able to hunt them and, and finally end up shooting them. It's quite a privilege to be able to do that. I'm proud of this deer. Well, we've had some history with this deer over the last couple days. We've seen him four times. It all turned out turned out well, so I'm sure proud of him. But that was sure an exciting hunt, wasn't it? Man, all the stuff that went on. I mean, we had, we saw a bunch of deer. Good job, buddy. All right. Now you get to gut him. You're not doing it. I'm not doing it. Chad can do it. Chad. I'll fail. <laughs> okay. Oh, let's get a look at him. Good mature deer. As it turned out, November 7th was a great day. And a big thanks to Bill for switching stands with me and letting me be on the trigger. This is probably the second largest deer I've ever shot. And uh, just a big mature buck. Couldn't be any happier. I figured out real quick walking up on this deer, I saw these little short G2s. This is that buck that we've called Jamie. We got so much history with this deer. You know, at least we've been trying to see this deer for so long and it's pretty cool to finally get a crack at him and, and uh, put him on the ground. So, Jamie's down. Yes, I just shot him. That's awesome. Can't believe I got him. For a while there, I didn't think anything else would come out, but he, but he did and I shot him. 
That's really cool. This time of the year, it's tough to kill a mature buck with a bow. There's so many eyes in the fields and the, yes, a good deer, fully mature buck. That's what we're trying to do. It's pretty cool. So it's pretty cool that this deer completely disappeared off the farm and then popped back up again more than a year later. And we have no idea where he went, but we do know that when he came back again, he was a whole lot bigger. That deer right there ran off a 200 inch typical. It was coming right in. So we had two bucks. <laughs> we had two bucks between 190 and, and low 200s within 60 yards of the tree stand. Nobody's gonna believe it. I don't believe it. There'll never be another day like that. It's impossible. Just got done saying this morning really doesn't have a very good feel to it. And it wasn't five minutes later and we had bucks moving through and he shot his and bah! tried to do an update and this one came in right behind us. So it's definitely a good double up morning. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> this is a buck that we call Flyers because he's got two points coming off of right there. This guy's a giant, and I might go a long time before I get another chance to shoot one this big. We thought he was a big deer, but I guess until you actually hold him in your hand, you don't appreciate how big they really are. The story continues. Yeah. Here he is. I'm, I'm really excited. This is great. It's the first year I've shot in years. I mean, it's been 2008 maybe, 2007, since I've shot anything. And this is the biggest buck I've ever shot. So this, this is great. This is, this is awesome. It's kind of cool. This one had a nice blood trail to follow. And I made a nice hit on him. It's that big old mature buck. Man, it sure is a privilege to be able to hunt deer like this. And I just thank God for the opportunity, for the blessing to be able to go out into the creation that he made for us and hunt deer like this. It's quite a dream come true, really. I've been after this deer for so long. This is, those battle scars have stories to tell. So we've got the video footage of, of him fighting the night when he lost that hair. Because huh. the next day that he came out, all the hair was missing on his shoulders. Huh. So we actually have footage of him fighting the buck. I wonder which deer that was. That'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Yeah. Man, that was a fun hunt. I shot a nice eight-pointer back in September in the youth season, and now I just shot another one last night. I've had a great season this year. <laughs> you know what I mean? We had to have been, literally, we had to have been within 10 feet of that deer. Yeah. So he was one of those legends. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. What a cool deer. I mean, really, when you think about it, as excited as you can be, really, about any buck. There's no doubt about it, old Loppy was a true legend on the farm. That's our buddy, old Curly. Seven, he's at least seven years old. He's an old deer. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to get a close look at this buck. Like I was saying earlier, I've got a bunch of trail camera pictures of him. He's just a cool, old character buck. One of the deer that was you know, primary target uh, from this spot. Well, the journey for this buck has finally ended. Uh, this is uh, a deer that we had uh, pictures of, that Bill had pictures of earlier this fall. So I'm just really thankful to be able to recover this buck, and it's a great way to wrap up the late season. There he is. Yes. That's a cool old buck. Yeah. I love how that main beam tips up on the end there. Mm -hmm. That's really neat, it's like a fish hook. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Well, there's nothing like taking it down to the last hour of your season before filling a tag. So I feel very thankful, uh, very blessed to have the opportunity to uh, get a crack at a, a cool old mature buck like this on the last day that I get to hunt, the last hour of my season. So you never know, you gotta, you gotta put your time in. Uh, you, can, you can have a good plan, but uh, at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to just being in the right place at the right time and having the kind of luck fall your way. He's a big old brood of a deer. How do you, it's hard to top a season like this. You know, these were the two biggest deer on the farm that we knew of. It was Lefty, um, got him back in October, and then this one. So, 
you know, like I said, it's just a lot of luck involved in, in having all those pieces fall into place. An old tight rack tent. He's a narrow little bugger. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and that more than two inches between the ends of his two main beams. I can't believe that. That's crazy. <laughs> it just shows, it just shows how quick your season can change during the rut. And all of a sudden, just like that, literally 15 seconds, 30 seconds, minute max, the whole season completely changes. He's a cool deer. I mean, every deer that you kill uh, is a trophy. This is, uh, I mean, it's perfect. It's the perfect ending for the first part of the bow season. And that was a surprise buck. Wow. Oh man, I'm shaking now. <laughs> I don't shake very often, but who would have thought? The 23rd of October. What a buck. Dang. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean he was the deer. He was the deer we wanted to get. You know, he's he's a five-year-old buck and you know we're always trying to manage for five-year-old and older on this farm whenever possible. And so he was the perfect candidate. I mean, what a privilege to be able to see something like that this evening. I mean, it's something that I'm sure I'll never see again. So I'm sitting here with a sense of sadness that this buck is no longer on the farm for me to hunt, but at least I'm ending the quest with a great deal of satisfaction in knowing that I finally harvested the legendary G4 buck. Oh gosh, look at that thing. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. We'll mark that one down. If anybody ever says, what is a surprise buck? I'm humbled and I'm blessed to be able to hunt deer like this on a farm like this. You know, it's going to be hard to top this one. So I appreciate, you know, all of the viewers that have, you know, stuck with us over the years watching Midwest Whitetail, and you know, it's just fun to just see it go from, you know, some pretty lean years to, you know, now lucking into a really good deer. So I bought the farm in 2002, started to with the first piece, and then built it from there. So there were a lot of hunts that took place from 2002 through 2007 that we didn't document on camera. So we're gonna run through some pictures of some of those bucks now too, just so you get a feel for all the deer and, and uh, kind of the sizes of the bucks that we killed over the years. And I'll, I'll let it roll while I'm talking here. But uh, it was, as I mentioned last week, uh, a, a property with a lot of deer on it when I bought it. And it brought the population down somewhat, but really flipped that buck to doe ratio. So there was a lot more bucks than does during that 2006, seven, eight, nine, and then it started to even back out again, closer to 10, 11, 12, back to, you know, closer to one to one. But there were periods of time there where we were killing a lot of bucks. Uh, I think in 2008 or nine, 10 maybe, we were killing five, six, seven bucks uh, on that property each year, counting the ones that myself, guests, and family were shooting. And it could sustain that very easily because there were a lot of older age class bucks there. So with the higher populations and more bucks like that, you know, we could sustain it, you know, a, a fair amount of buck hunting. But then we hit that 2012 time, like I mentioned, when the EHD hit us hard and uh, it went into something of a downward spiral for a few years. So in 15, I think was the worst season. I don't know if we killed any bucks on the farm in 2015, maybe one. Uh, so it went from the highs to the lows. And then, you know, now as I sold it, it was coming back into the, you know, the prime again. So what did I learn? Uh, gosh, there were a lot of lessons, but I think the most important lesson that I learned was the value of identifying specific bucks and learning their individual behavior. Uh, it's, that was what probably surprised me the most. You know, being able to hunt the same property year after year, you got a chance to see those same deer as they changed, uh, as, they, as their behavior changed from year to year. And it was surprising uh, how their personalities would become more distinct as they got older. You know, you can lump all the two and a half and three, three and a half year old bucks into a pool, you know, by age class and say, two and a half year old bucks do this and three and a half year old bucks do this and you won't be too far off. But once you get into those older age class deer, every single buck seemed to be different. And you had to learn those deer individually in order to hunt them effectively. And I found that to be really fascinating. That process was probably the most rewarding part of owning that farm, I believe, was just the amount of information that I was able to gather from all the trail cameras that we, we ran and all the time that I spent hunting individual bucks about their behavior. Uh, some of them would have big ranges. You know, we had bucks, there was one that 
We had nicknamed Bubba, and uh, he had a really big range. I mean, the neighbors were getting pictures of him all the time. They were finding sheds off the deer. We were picking him up on our farm. I mean, I think he was at least a two mile wide, pretty consistent range that he was using. And then uh, there were bucks like the double G4 buck that I killed in 2012. I don't think his range was much more than about 30 acres. And I'm saying like the whole entirety of where he spent his year was when this was in this little small area. And I know that because I was really trying to peg that deer. I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out as much as I could about him. And I had trail cameras all around what I figured was his core and he didn't leave it. Uh, that area was where he was at all the time. I could find him there every single day, sometimes in daylight, often in daylight, he would show up on cameras that I had placed in the, inside of that area. Um, so that was a completely different type of a deer. They were both older age class bucks, completely separate personalities. So that was probably the key lesson, was just how much different these mature bucks can be one to the other and how much fun they are to hunt. You know, it's, uh, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be fun to hunt, you know, places where I didn't have a lot of information or I didn't, you know, have that history with the deer. I would still enjoy deer hunting, but there was something that was satisfying about picking one individual deer and then trying to learn enough about that deer to uh, eventually tag him. And putting that puzzle together, uh, that, was, that was the, I would say, one of the most rewarding things. The most memorable hunts I think would surprise you. Everybody would assume that it was the biggest deer. You know, the, the hunts for some of these big iconic bucks that you know, we killed on the farm over the years. But that's not really the case. I mean, I remember those hunts, obviously. I take a lot of satisfaction in the pursuit and the way those hunts turned out. But really the most memorable hunts are the ones that I spent with our family. You know, I can remember every moment uh, of, of you know the hunts that, that were Jordan or Drew took their first deer. You know, I've got uh, just etched in my memory uh, the, the time when Drew killed his first buck with a bow and the things that came out of his mouth. And it just, the, the, the whole adventure is so fresh and you get to relive your own uh, fascination with hunting through their eyes. And maybe that's what it is about, there's just so much innocence to it that this makes it just, I don't know, something that just sticks with you. But, so those are the most memorable hunts, um, you know, and that's what I'll miss, you know, on that farm. And also people think that you're gonna miss the farm. And, and you, you know, I will miss the farm. I had a lot of, of, of uh, satisfaction, like I said, in developing that property and, and making it into a great whitetail place. But really, again, it comes back to where the memories took place. And, and that was at the house. You know, the, the thing that I'll miss most is our house. You know, the kids grew up there. You know, that's where the memories are. So. The, the, the part that's hardest to leave behind are the places where the memories are the rawest. You know, so that's just something that people might not think about on something like this. It's not necessarily, you know, the Death Ridge tree stand that I'm going to miss. You know, it might be that little ground blind where, you know, one of the kids shot their first deer. Um, so it's catching me a little bit today. I'm just starting to remember, you know, think back on some of those hunts and, and uh, you know, what that meant. You know, back at that time and still you know today uh, so let's get let's get away from this topic so I can get my head cleared again um, I think you know I've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of comments since we aired last week's episode and I do appreciate all the feedback and the people that were saying you know good luck and you know with, with your next venture and so forth I really do appreciate that um, and, and I think that uh, you know, no updates for you on that front. You know, I'm still in the process of trying to find something to buy. I've got places to hunt. But, uh, so one of the things that came up uh, pretty often in that feedback was the question of how I put that farm together. And people wanted a lot of detail on that. And, you know, it would, and, and I mentioned it last week, it would take hours and, and maybe even a book to go through everything that I had to learn and all the things that had to fall into place for me to be able to put that much land together on the amount of income that I had to work with. But the key to it, and I keep telling people, is you have to think um, a little bit outside the box. You have to be creative. The thing with land is there's not like a set way that you have to buy it. It's not like you're going in and buying a pair of tennis shoes. There's a lot of ways you can buy land. Um, and, and you just have to be creative. I mean, the bank can factor into it. Uh, there's ways that you can take maybe some timber off the property to make your down payment. You know, there's, there's things that, that are built into real estate 
it gives you more flexibility. And especially when you buy one and then resell it and buy a different one, some of the tax advantages of doing it a certain way. And uh, so really, uh, the, the, the key to it is you have to have a lot of desire. You have to work hard to find properties that are undervalued. And then you'll take those undervalued properties, put a little bit of time, of, of time and energy into them and get them so they're worth more. Then you sell those and then you buy something that's a little bit more expensive, a few more acres. You just keep rolling. So I was buying other properties that were undervalued and then I was selling those and then using the proceeds from those sales to buy the land that bordered my original starting point. So that's how I did it. It was, it was more about being able to cast a wide net and find properties that might be as much as two, two hours or more away from where I lived that were below market value, buy those, uh, hold them for a little while, you know, do some work on them, you know, get them so that they're more valuable, then resell them and then you know, use that money to buy the stuff that my neighbors had for sale. So that was the, the, the then I used options, you know, different tools. Like I said, there's, there's lots of flexibility in real estate. Uh, I bought an island, 160 acre island. And it was about a two hour drive away from my home, but there was a lot of marketable timber on it. And uh, the guy who had it for sale, of course, he knew there was marketable timber on there, but you know, getting timber off an island isn't such a simple thing. But <laughs> by the time I got done, I had built a bridge out to this island with the permission of the Army Corps of Engineers. I had taken all of the, the logs off that were of you know, certain value. I, take, I took the logs, I transported the logs you know, through my own crews to the mill. I paid them a custom cutting fee to cut those into boards. And then they held onto those boards in my name and then they took a, a, a marketing fee and sold those boards for me. So I didn't sell trees, I didn't sell logs, I sold boards. Uh, and so that was how I did it, stuff like that. I mean, I didn't have enough money to do it the conventional way. So don't think inside the box. Uh, there are lots of things you can do uh, to, to uh, you know, get from point A to point B if you, want to, if you want to own that land bad enough. So that's my positive encouragement for the day. That's where the whole dream big idea came from, was, was taking this idea and making it into something big. And Midwest Whitetail was an idea that became something big, and my farm was an idea that became something big. And, and I, I learned how to do it, and you can learn how to do it. Uh, you know, you just don't want to sell yourself short on your ability to to uh, come up with something bigger than maybe what people think you can do because that's, that's what both of these projects were. They turned out to be bigger than what I think anybody thought was possible. Uh, so I'm gonna leave you with that. Uh, and the final thought again is just the fact that, you know, memories uh, are the key. Memories are the main thing. That's the reason we hunt. You know, it's not about bringing home a trophy and showing it off to everybody. It's about creating those memories. And uh, you know, just just uh, don't get don't get the wrong idea of what this is all about. You know, we're not trying to kill trophy deer to make ourselves you know into some big you know outdoor celebrities. It's great if we can get some viewership and, and you know we can make some money doing this, but really it's all about creating the memories. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with that today, and, and uh, I know we've got a lot a lot of other pro staff and. and you know, staff that are going to be updating on what's going on. I know Jared's been elk hunting, Mike's been elk hunting. Uh, we got plenty of stuff to talk about in the next episode. And I may come back again and talk some more about the farm, but you know, like I said, it's, I want this to be water under the bridge for me. I want to move on. Um, you know, it was a great chapter, but you know, the more I think about it, sometimes the more I have seller's remorse and I'm, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'll see you right back here again uh, next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.